and following, that, following a fascinating intervention by Gilbert. And unfortunately, I don't have a power point. Um, one day, maybe, uh, that bullet might be bitten. But uh, so you won't have the visual aids in this. Um, and it's quite a, it's a big subject. I mean, Gilbert is dealing globally. Um, I'm going to attempt to fit the EU um, into that global picture and, um, and say something about the role of the EU within that global picture. So I'm going to try, if I can fit in, I'm going to try to so, say something about the, the origins and political nature of the EU, where it fits into world imperialism today, the brutal, the brutal role it's carried out and is still carrying out um, in Greece, um, and then finish with well something about the continuing crisis of the EU, which I would I would argue actually remains an existential crisis of the EU and of the eurozone, and end up with saying how I think we should vote in the referendum on the EU uh, when it comes. Um, the EU was conceived in the immediate post-war period in the 1950s um, orig originally as a customs union, a reasonably small customs, uh, customs union, um, and also a gesture towards um, unity in the post-war period, no more wars in Europe and that kind of thing. Um, by the 1990s, Various developments in world politics had transformed it into something completely different. It had transformed it into the key strategic um, objective of the European capitalist class uh, to create a European superstate um, in order to attempt to um, in order to attempt to compete more effectively. Well, it was globalisation. In order to compete more effectively in a globalised world with emerging power blocks in other parts of the world, at that time in particular um, Japan um, and, and the USA. So there was, well, there, was three, there was three developments really that shaped the EU we've got it today. There was globalisation, as I've just said. Um, there was the need to fully embrace the um, neoliberal project which was being uh, promoted by Reagan and Thatcher in the 80s and ensure that that became the central, central to the politics of, of, of the EU. And also the fall of the Berlin Wall, um, the collapse of the Soviet Union and the bloc states in Eastern Europe and the need of European capitalism to expand to the East. So these things brought, these things brought together um, what determined really where, where, the, where the EU was going. The key treaties that shaped these developments was the Single European Act of 1986, which essentially transformed the EU from an economic project into a, a political project. And then the <coughs> Maastricht Treaty of 1992 uh, with the single currency, uh, which was introduced by the, at the end of the century, uh, which, which Shaped, it in, shaped the EU in a way to, uh, to carry out that role. So, uh, so from the Single European Act onwards, um, the key objective of the European bourgeoisie was European integration, the move, the move towards a single state. And the thinking behind that was that if they're going to, um, if they're going to compete with other power blocks in the world, then they needed, like those other power blocks, a single leadership which could act quickly and take decisions in the way that the governments of the, of the USA and, and, and Japan could do. Uh, some kind of federal setup um, in Europe uh, would be would be really no no um, would, would be not able to compete with them um, in that way. The result was. Um, what, we, what we've seen uh, in recent years, which is the EU of today, which is a, a supranational construct um, designed to, um, to help the 
the member states more effectively <coughs> impose austerity on, on their domestic working classes um, and to help them to do it and direct them to do it and force them to do it um, if, if, if that is necessary. The single currency was never really just a currency. I mean, you could say that no currency is just a currency, but the, the, the single currency was even more so uh, not a currency. Uh, the, the, it, was, it was right from the start um, a mechanism to enforce austerity and to destroy welfare. As Gilbert mentioned, um, the guiding principle of the single currency is the restriction uh, of borrowing to 3% of, of GDP. Um, this means that when the single currency was introduced, they froze the economies, they froze the economies at that time in a way that the only way that that, um, that debt um, or, or, the, the debt or, or um, insolvency uh, can be tackled is through austerity. There is no other way. It has to be cuts, it has to be cuts in welfare. That's built, that's built into the system. Um, the EU is unable to make capital transfers, for example, as is possible in somewhere like the United States because it, it says it's a completely different, uh, it's a completely different uh, structure. Um, the EU was, um, was undemocratic from the outset, um, but it has to be said that um, each of the many treaties that we've had since the 1980s reshaping the EU has actually made it um, less democratic and not more democratic. And so there is now um, a, a huge democratic uh, deficit in the EU. Um, the power in the, EU, in the EU resides in the Council of Ministers and in the Commission. Um, the Parliament um, has, has no real powers um, at the end of the day. And they were, therefore, they were, it's also therefore unreformable because there is no mechanism with, within the EU to which to change its fundamental nature um, through, the, through the European Parliament. There's no, no, no democratic way. In fact, it's less democratic um, even than the member states. It's less democratic even than the British state with our horrendous electoral system and everything else. Because, uh, because in Britain you can, you know, if, if, depending on all kinds of undemocratic procedures and so on, you can change a government, where, whereas you can't, you can't do that uh, within, the, within the, the European Union. Now if, if, we, if we want to look at the, the real nature um, of the EU, then we look at what's happened in Greece. Um, the real face of the EU is the Troika and the, uh, the role that the Troika has played in Greece. Um, we've seen in Greece, Greece has been for the last five or six years, um, Greece has been the epicentre of the struggle against austerity um, Europe-wide. Um, we've all followed it. We've had in Greece you know, 30 general strikes, we've had thousands of strikes, thousands of demonstrations, big social movements, and, and et cetera, et cetera, uh, against, uh, against the, uh, the EU elites uh, forcing, in, forcing austerity um, through um, in Greece. And, uh, and um, the brutality of it was there for all to see. You know, the weapons of choice of the elites to uh, in, in forcing, in, in, in applying pressure to the Syriza government elected in, in January uh, was on the one hand the use of the banks, to the European central banks, to threaten to close banks, actually close banks, to threaten, down, threaten to close the cash machines and all this kind of thing. And on the other hand, the threat to, of expulsion from the EU itself, which was a potent weapon um, in Greece because the, uh, the, the majority of the population were, were at least very worried about um, being, being ex expelled uh, from, the, from the EU. Um, what we've seen in Greece recently with the, uh, with, um, uh, with, with the recent election and before the election, we've seen probably the most spectacular collapse um, of a left-wing leadership um, in, in front of austerity that, um, that, that has been seen for a very long, very, very long time. Um, we had the, we had the, uh, the, the referendum um, on the memorandum 
um, which produced a 61% a, a majority uh, to reject the, the, the memorandum and continue resistance. And then in five days, we had total collapse uh, with the leadership of Syriza uh, calling in the other parties and throwing in the towel and saying, we accept the full terms, in fact, we accept even worse terms uh, than, uh, than the ones that are in offer. A spectacular collapse and actually um, a, a, a significant defeat um, of the workers' movement on, on a, a European scale. Um, this is a huge matter for the left in Europe um, and for the European workers' movement. Um, there is um, a big debate, and unsurprisingly, um, a, a big debate has opened up um, as to, uh, how to assess how to assess that, uh, that defeat. And um, the number of questions are, are at the centre of it. Uh, we can say, for example, um, well, the two sides of the debate really, the, the, the main lines of the debate are, did Syriza have an alternative or didn't have an alternative? Did, did it not have an alternative? Because, um, because the Cyprus leadership is saying, we had no alternative. What they were throwing at us was too much. Uh, it was unable, we were unable to sustain it and uh, we've had to make a tactical retreat to accept austerity and everything else. Uh, we've heard that before a lot of times in the past, and we'll hear it again. Um, I think we have to insist that, yes, there was entirely an alternative. Um, that alternative um, did mean making a stand against the European elites. Um, it was never going to be easy. It was always going to a big confrontation, and there was never any guarantee of success. However, there was a very good chance of success, and in any case, uh, you know, partial success would be a lot better than the total collapse uh, that we've seen. Um, it would have meant standing up to the elites. It would also have meant starting to take measures to take control of sections of the Greek state. Um, it would have meant, absolutely crucially, the control of the banks and the, and, and the financial institutions so that they couldn't be used against, they could be used in favour of, of the workers' movement and, and, and not against it. Um, and it would have, it would have meant uh, capital controls and, and, and various things. And it would also have meant the, the, uh, the mobilisation of a mass movement behind uh, behind the, the resistance in Greece. So there was, there was, there, there was an alternative. Um, also, the question arises, what does this say about building parties like Syriza? Is, is this an argument, well, maybe that's not the right thing to do because this one collapsed? Um, in fact, I, I wouldn't say actually this one collapsed because there was, a, as we know, a big opposition um, inside Suiza that at the point of capitulation formed a new party, Popular Unity, and, and stood in the election in a continued, continued struggle against austerity. That, in my opinion, they represent, they represent uh, the, the, um, uh, the best forces in, in, in Greece continuing the struggle against austerity. Um, they, did, they did very badly in the election. They clearly, they clearly were not able in the very short period of time to, uh, to present a real alternative uh, and, and get an electoral, an electoral vote behind them. Um, however, um, in my view, it doesn't in any way devalue, uh, devalue the, uh, the, the building of such parties because Syriza got itself in a position to do things. It got itself in a position to mount a struggle as it, as it, had it chosen to do so. The fact that it chose not to do so uh, is another matter. What it raises is the politics of the leadership of such parties and how such parties uh, uh, tackle the struggle when that kind of brutal confrontation takes place. And quite a lot of things I think can be said about, uh, about that, uh, uh, but probably the most, most significant one um, is the role of Eurocommunism um, and, and the role of left Europeanism. Um, I think the, I, I think, oh dear, I've only got five minutes. Um, um, 
I mean, I, 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 I have to finish up like this. The, the, the big lesson, the big lesson that comes out of, 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 the, of, of, the, of, of the capitulation of Suiza is you cannot, inside the, the EU and the Eurozone in particular, you cannot oppose austerity unless you're prepared to, uh, e to either leave the European Union or be expelled from it. It's absolutely, totally impossible. And if you start from a Euro communist position, or even a left European position, but particularly a communist position, then you're at a very big disadvantage right from the start. So, so the, it's, it's these political issues that I think we have to address when we look at the, 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 the defeat which has happened in Greece. Now, finally, then, on the referendum, where are we coming up? Um, it might seem that if we start from a position that the European Union is a, is a reactionary anti-working class organisation designed to increase the exploitation of the working class in Europe and subject it to the neoliberal agenda, then a no vote in the referendum is a no-brainer. Um, but I would argue that it absolutely is not. Um, it, my, my view is that um, I'm in principle for leaving the EU. I'm in principle for, leave, for seeing the EU leave the stage of history, go into the rubbish bin of history or whatever. Um, but I don't think that translates into um, we will vote to leave the EU, whatever the circumstances and whatever the consequences. And that's where I think the, the argument lies in this. The referendum that's coming up um, is not a referendum from a progressive position, to, from a progressive uh, exit from the EU, to build something better outside of the EU, or to have a better position to struggle outside the EU. This is, this is, this is, um, this is entirely a, a project of the Tory right and of UKIP, or more, a, a reaction of the Tories against UKIP, in order to steal the agenda uh, from UKIP. And so it's an entirely reactionary proposal uh, to leave the EU, uh, which, in my opinion, should it be successful and should there be a no vote, we would end, we would end up in a worse position afterwards than before it, and the right wing would come out much stronger. Um, and in fact, you could, easy, could easily have, in such a situation, because the Tory party has been split on Europe for decades, and is still split on Europe, because Cameron wants to stay in, he will, he, there's no, he, he will only campaign to stay in. He will, whatever, whatever he gets or he doesn't get in his so-called negotiations, he will say, this is a big victory, uh, we're going to stay in. Um, but if, if the vote goes for no, it's a massively strengthened UKIP and the Tory right. You could, get a re, you could get a realignment of the Tory right come out of it, and it would be, unlike, unlike, uh, uh, unlike 75, it would, be a, it would be a defeat for the left um, if, if it was a vote to come out. It would also leave, I have to say, that you know, European citizens um, living, uh, living in, in Britain, uh, which there are, there, are, uh, there are large numbers, would be in a very difficult position. And, and European citizens know that. They would be in a very difficult position with, with a no vote. They would have all kinds of things against them. Uh, and, uh, and, and it would be an endorsement of the racist agenda the tone of it will be racist from start to finish. The tone of it will be anti-immigrant from the start to finish. Um, any attempt to have a no campaign, or sorry, a, a campaign to stay in, um, from or no campaign uh, from a progressive point of view will be absolutely drowned out. And so, so I, I think at the moment, as things stand, um, I think we have to say that um, the right thing to do once the referendum comes uh, is to vote to stay in.